I can start with a, a, a question, uh, Mr. Anley. Uh, North Korean rhetoric, I mean, if you see these kind of ridiculous news reports from North Korea, uh, how are we to understand these kinds of rhetorics? And don't the North Koreans understand that if they lose the support of Beijing, they uh, lose the last ground they have to, to survive? Well, you know, there's a historical pattern here, and we've seen it uh, play out many times uh, in what's this called North Korean brinksmanship. Uh, over the last two decades, um, there you can see cycles where North Korean leaders will ratchet up the tension, um, will be very provocative, will bring the region to the brink of war. Um, and there's a study that was recently done by CSIS think tank in Washington, D.C. Within five months of North Korean brinksmanship, uh, in, in every case to this point, the North Koreans have gotten something for that. Some concession where the American side will say it needs to be the responsible power and it needs to do whatever it can to sort of ratchet the tension down. But the problem with that is that the only thing it does is it guarantees that the North Koreans will do it again. North Koreans don't have a lot of leverage, but they're not irrational. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, when North Korea sank the South Korean ship, the Chonan, in the spring of 2010, uh, what happened in the aftermath of that? South Korean defense minister was fired. South Korean President Yim Min Bak, his favorability rating plummeted. And there was great friction between China and the United States. Now, if you're the North Korean leader, what is your conclusion? I'm going to do something like this again. Because this really benefited me and benefited and made me look strong within my own country. Because this is really all about North Korean domestic politics. And so uh, in thinking through ways that the United States and China could cooperate, one easy fix would be in the aftermath of these provocative acts, if we, the United States, China, United States, China South Korea, Japan, Russia, can all speak with one voice in condemning the uh, provocative action, then I think we'd be in a much better position to potentially break this negative cycle of brinksmanship that we've seen, you know, uh, historically take place. I've noticed uh, two gentlemen, and I also noticed uh, you, so there's still room to take the floor if you want to. First gentleman is the one sitting on the back there, the yellow jersey, please. And remember to be brief and speak up. Thank you for your insights, Mr. Hanley. Thank you. Um, in debates with my Chinese friends, the, one, the question arises about inclusion and income inequality. Uh, they tend to uh, regard the internal going west policy as an important uh, question in Chinese politics. I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. It's Thank about you. pollution and inequality. Please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very good point. And I think uh, this is one of the policies that Chinese leaders hope to carry out. And I think some of this is happening naturally anyways. I mean, there are policy incentives to shift the manufacturing and other industrial bases from the coast where those regions have really benefited from the economic growth. And the interior part of China has not benefited as much. But what's happening today is that labor costs are now cheaper in the interior. And so naturally, businesses are actually moving uh, more towards the interior as the infrastructure is developed further and they can get goods from the interior to the coast, it makes it easier for um, manufacturing and other industry bases to move, to shift. So I think it's both the, the going west policy, which you mentioned, which provides some incentives to move uh, production inland, but it's also just a, a natural sort of, and, and this was a deliberate policy decision by the Chinese. Um, we have a scholar at the Carnegie Endowment, Yukon Huang, who wrote a very good piece on this about two years ago. Um, and it talks about, he talks about the decisions by Deng Xiaoping in the early part of the reform to focus the, uh, the economic development 
in the special economic zones, which were, the three or four of them were along the coast of China. And the idea was that these areas would uh, develop and prosper, and then eventually over time, the development would move to the interior of China. And I think we're beginning to see that now. The other, I think, element to watch is uh, the urbanization. And this is something that the new leadership has said they're going to focus on, which is building larger cities. Um, and they believe that this can raise consumption, which is something that you're trying to do, um, and move the rural population into urban areas. If you look at South Korea, for example, 20 years ago, South Korea was 75% rural and 25% urban. In the transition to become a high income economy, they have they have flipped that over. They're now 75% urban and 25% rural. And China is looking to do a similar transformation. Uh, I've registered four more speakers on the list. First is the gentleman right behind there and then the lady. So go ahead, please introduce yourself and speak up. Uh, my name is Rolf Kevin. Uh, thank you for an uh, insightful speech about China. Uh, you, need, you, did, you, you mentioned the, the importance that they are placing on corruption. And we know that <coughs> internationally in the West we are also dealing with this, this question. The, how do you abolish the, uh, the tax, tax havens? So my question is, can you see um, some sort of, uh, of uh, common interests and, and common approaches between uh, America China the, and, uh, and Europe on this, this, these questions. Also, the, you did mention the, uh, Russia. Uh, and Russia, we know, is uh, going to the, to the bad about uh, corruption. And how do you see that affects the, uh, the, the, the relationships between mm. Russia and, and, and China, which mm. has been historically very important? So the question is about uh, corruption and the relationship between Russia and China, and you also mentioned the US. Please, Mr. Hanley. That's a very interesting question, and one that I've never, never uh, been asked. Um, I think my own sense is that you know, the Chinese system is so unique in some aspects that uh, Chinese officials probably instinctually don't look to the United States or Russia uh, to find models for improving or to, to deal with the issue of corruption. But I bet you your, your premise is probably right, that there are lessons that could be learned or you know, international best cases that are, or uh, best models that could be applied. Um, but I don't know that they're doing a lot of that. And while I think that there is potential for cooperation on international issues, I don't think Chinese leaders would be willing at this point to openly cooperate with the United States on such a purely domestic issue. I think they would see this as potentially very politically difficult for them. There's a lot of criticism in China today about Western forms of government specifically the United States. And there is a feeling that, in some quarters, that the United States has lectured China about uh, economic models and about political models and about democracy. Uh, and they look at their system today, and while they realize that it's not the best system and it has its problems, they look at the US model and they say, we're really not interested in that either. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a difficult proposition to think that the Chinese would be interested in, in learning from us about uh, corruption. But I, but I bet you there are smart people in their system that are looking at corruption around the world and, and how it's been developed. I mean, the Chinese are very good at, at, at looking, uh, you know, quietly sort of researching how other countries have dealt with that issue. There's a commission of inquiry passed by the UN, and you know we are going to they are going to unanimously um, agree upon like looking into the Korean human rights issues. You know my question is that I know that you work for Carnegie, and you know your ties in China are pretty um, 
pretty significant. Um, is there any way that the <coughs> inquiry could put pressure on China to stop the forced repatriation of North Korean refugees hiding in uh, North Korea? And um, how do you see this happening? And is there something that we can do as a civil society? Thank you. So the question is about human rights, uh, China, North Korea. Please, Mr. Anley. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very good question, and you, you obviously work for a very good cause. And uh, so I commend you for that. The human rights situation in North Korea, as, as far as we know, I mean, it's quite opaque, the system. Um, but we have quite a bit of anecdotal evidence to suggest the human rights situation is deplorable in North Korea. And it was a great concern of President Obama's, um, President Bush's especially. Um, you know, the, it's a difficult, we, I always found when I was in the government that it's a difficult, to be effective and try to affect change from the outside is, all, is very, very difficult work. Um, this issue that you raise on forced repatriation is an issue that we raised with the Chinese in our own dialogue um, and uh, have seen modest improvements over the years, but certainly not to the, to the extent that we would like to see. Your question on whether the Carnegie Endowment, was that your specific question on whether we can do something like that? Um, I'd like to hear more of your ideas, maybe offline, and we can we can talk about it because um, I don't have any initial ideas yet. On it. We're not working specifically on that issue. Then I have the gentleman sitting there. Yes, you please stand up and speak up. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Rick Bosch, uh, American uh, living in uh, Norway for uh, three years. Uh, based on you, your your comments on China looking inward. Is uh, the global community and the world media, we're always you know, hearing China's doing this, and, uh, and it's portrayed as uh, expansionist, or possibly they have ulterior motives. But if China, is, is this simply a sleeping giant syndrome, where as, you know, China sneezes, everybody gets a cold. So when they are making a move to do something with mainly an inward looking policy, Everybody, it affects so many people and it's such an impact on everybody that is perceived in, in somewhat threatening or in other ways. And my second question is, in the global diplomatic debate, debate, is North Korea just being used as a tool for diplomacy and communications in sort of a strange, weird sort of way, but it's been done before where you use the military to make a statement is North Korea being used by the Chinese to make statements, doing things where they can take the high ground and not sort of do the dirty work or, or, or make an impact to create some other cause? And is this being done by China using North Korea? And is it also being used by the West, so to speak, in a similar way? And is this a grand communication tool? Or is North Korea just a little bit crazy and you know, off doing their own thing, which seems to be hard to believe? Like yes, on the last point. Oh, okay, to summarize the question, um, do we understand China? Do we perceive them correctly? And is North Korea used as a tool for Chinese statements? Please, Mr. Anli. Sure. Uh, uh, the first question is, is really the $64,000 question, right? That's the, the one that everyone's trying to figure out. Um, and you mentioned up front the media, and so let me start there, because I think that you know, we, it would be good to see improvements in the way uh, our own media deals with the issue of China. You know, so much in the media, I find these days, is very is sort of zero sum. Somebody, you know, one side wins and the other side loses, right? And this, maybe this is the calculation of what sells newspapers. But you hardly read a story that says, you know, the U.S. and China or the EU and China work together and and you know, achieved this. Now, it could be because there's not enough of that happening. But you, when you read the newspaper, it's China, either China loses and the international community wins, or the international community wins and China loses. So I think some of this, you know, the, the, the reporting, I think, coming you know, on China should be, I think, much more nuanced and, and reflect uh, you know, better, more deeper understanding. But I think part of the problem is, you, know, you ultimately asked, what, what is China doing internationally, what, you know, what is the role internationally, what are they trying to do internationally, I'm not sure they know 
You know, we had at our center two years ago a three-day workshop on China's public diplomacy. And the idea was we brought Chinese experts on public diplomacy together to talk about how China should project its own image to the world and, and so, that the, so that the world better understands China and the type of role that they're trying to play in the world and some of their own values and things like that. It was all geared around how should China do it. But the three days were spent talking about what China's role should be, what kind of image they want to present, what kind of values they bring to the table. And so they never got to the question of how to do it because they were so intently working on the question of what is it we want to do. So I think you know China is playing a larger role in the world today. Um, I often say that it's doing so reluctantly. I think that if China could deal with its domestic challenges and its own development and economic issues within its own borders, it would. But it's, it's so big now and so powerful that it can no longer do that. And so it now needs to go out in the world for commercial reasons, for energy reasons, to satisfy their own domestic agenda. And so they're not going out in the world, like I said, because they want to play a greater role and, and help the world. They're going out in the world because of their own domestic agenda. And so you see them going to Africa uh, for energy resources, South America. They're looking at the Arctic Circle now uh, for, for trade routes and for other you know, energy and, 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 and minerals and resources. But this is all tied to their own domestic agenda. So I think the jury is still out on you know, what ultimately will China be in the world today. And I think my own view is that's why we've got to engage China now. Because we need to have that conversation to say, you know, what is your ultimate aim? And how will that impact us? And what are the areas of convergence where we agree that you know, this is OK? And, but more importantly, what are the areas of divergence? You know, where do we see China's role evolving that we might find uh, inimical to our own interests? And, and we should be dealing with those today. And so, I mean, that's really what Carnegie Tsinghua Center in China is trying to do, is engage China in this debate now so that uh, it can help shape the thinking, not only in China, but in the international community about how best to deal with this rising China. Because it is rising. It is playing a more influential role in the world. It is becoming more powerful. Whether China likes it or not, that's the reality. Whether we like it or not, that's the reality, and we have to deal with it. Uh, I noticed seven speakers in about uh, roughly 20 minutes, so I have to close the speaking list now, but I will do my absolutely best to make sure that everybody who have uh, wanted the floor is, is getting it. But then remember to do as the past speakers, be very brief and concrete. First out is the here. Uh, by the way, I missed a question of, of his, and I'm sorry. Can I take a quick yeah, second yeah, to answer you? Very quick. Especially because he's American, and I want to make sure. That, <laughs> and I know why you live here. I mean, it's a beautiful country, and, and I'm you know, mad that this is my first time coming here. Um, you, you wanted to make, talk about China's role in the six party talks, because I, and I think it's an important question. You know, what ultimately is China doing? What is the US doing in this? I think that. Um, you know, I, I mean, you could argue that you know China, as the chair of the six-party talks, you know, likes it because they look like they're in an elevated role, playing this diplomatic role and trying to resolve an issue, and that they don't really, at the end of the day, care if the issue is resolved as long as they can be in this position and look as though you know they're playing this important diplomatic role. And that I, you know, that was the case sometimes when, 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 when I was at these meetings of the six-party talks. I felt sometimes that China is not really interested in progress. They're interested in the perception of progress, and they're interested in, you know, their the perceived role that they're playing in that progress. But I do think it's changing now, and I think that China now sees more urgently that progress needs to be achieved because you know, continued provocation and instability by a North Korean leader is beginning to negatively affect China's own interests. And so I tell my American friends, you know, working in the White House, China's calculus is changing, not because of U.S. pressure, 
and not because U.S. policy has been effective in getting the Chinese to change their calculus. It's changing because their own interests are changing and because they're growing weary of this 29-year-old uh, leader of North Korea that he has what it takes to lead the country. They're growing, they, they're worried he's overreaching. They're worried that he's going to cause the instability that they're trying to prevent. And so I think now they're engaged in the game more than they were before. But I think the big inhibitor for cooperation between the US and China on North Korea is that ultimately at the end of the day, China worries that the US wants forcible regime change in North Korea. And China doesn't see that in its, in its interest. China wants the North Korea regime to change, but it doesn't want forcible regime change. And there's a big difference. What China would prefer is that North Korea move from a military first policy to an economic first policy. That they start a reform and economic process very similar that, to what China did in the early mm -hmm. 80s and that they become a more normal country. That's what China wants. And then what they say is, at that point, we can get their nuclear weapons. And this is the rub, because American officials say, well, how long is that going to take? And we can only get the nuclear weapons at the end of that stage, when they become a more normal country? That seems way down the line in the American view. And so I think what's needed now is number one, if US policy is not forcible regime change, then Obama should find ways to reassure Xi Jinping that he is not going to use China as a tool to achieve forcible regime change, that, that he understands Chinese concerns and will work to uh, respect those. But the Chinese side also has to move up the, in priority, the idea of getting North Korean nuclear weapons. It cannot be that far down the line. And I think that's really the challenge that we have before us. Thank you. Then, please. Yeah, sure. But just remember to speak up. You should limit the questions. We could have. A well, to, to su summarize, uh, first part is about the six party talks. Have there been a failure? What's your perception about these? Are there coming new six party talks, uh, the sea clashes, and how is the academic influence in, in China? And, and uh, I hate to do that, Mr. Andy, but I, I will have to ask you to be brief as well. Yes, yes I will. Um, six party talks. You know, my, my own view is that if we can get to the point where we're uh, we're having dialogue with the North Koreans, then I think we're in a better place. Uh, 2007 to 2009, I worked on the six-party talks. We had um, Americans in North Korea at the, at the nuclear facility, continuous presence. I traveled there six times. Um, I don't necessarily like to sit across the table from North Koreans, but I think it's important. And uh, so if we can do that, 
then that we're in a better place. The problem is, and the Chinese are very quick to say, oh, let's return to the six party talks. But the North Koreans have violated many of the agreements that were made. They've made many statements that, uh, that you know, they're, they're no longer a member of the six party talks. They've started a uranium enrichment program. They've done so much to undermine the six party talks that allowing the six party talks to just meet again basically means that as a framework, it means nothing. If the agreements that are made at the six party talks are not lived up to, then we can't use the six party talks as a, it's not a viable platform. So somehow we have to get all parties to recommit to what they've already agreed to. And we have to get the North Koreans to stand down on the things that are violating those agreements. And only at that point can we come back to this again. We can't get to that point. It, it, it makes no sense. Uh, territorial issues, uh, very complicated issue, but I'll make a couple, couple comments. I see this, you know, more as a domestic issue actually with China. You know, it is a it is a foreign policy issue, but I see it's very tied to China's domestic issue. No Chinese leader can look weak uh, on these territorial issues, uh, and so and especially against the backdrop of rising nationalism in China, and especially against the backdrop of what I talked about, where Xi Jinping is coming in. He's trying to consolidate his power. He's not in a position right now to appear to be making concessions or engaging in creative diplomacy. And that's, that's unfortunate. And so I'm not optimistic about the short term. But over the long term, as he you know, consolidates his base of support, if he would like to find creative ways for China to sort of step back and, and also Japan to step back, I think over the medium term, perhaps these kind of things can emerge. But right now, it's, it's very difficult and the most pressing issue is that we now have Chinese ships and planes and Japanese ships and planes, you know, operating in very close proximity. So the chances of conflict have gone uh, way up. Um, on the, the pivot, I think, if I understand your question correctly, my own view is the pivot was rolled out the way it was rolled out and the elements of it, in large part because of Chinese assertiveness and aggressive over, aggressiveness over the last few years have caused Southeast Asian countries in particular and other allies in the Asia Pacific to come to the United States to say, don't leave the Asia Pacific. We're not looking to choose you over China. We want good relations with both, but we need you to remain in the region as a counterbalance to growing Chinese influence. And so if you mean that they perceive it per, you know, precisely in that regard, I think they're starting to understand that. And their foreign minister is now on a listening tour of Southeast Asia right now which is interesting. And so perhaps they realize that um, they caused some of the pivot. And the academics influence in China, you know, it's, it's, it, it is an open question to me. I think some senior academics have more influence than sort of mid-level or junior. I mean, that's sort of common sense. But um, our senior partner at Tsinghua, I understand, had a good relationship with a- Are they open when they talk to you? And are they open? They, uh, in fact, are, well, it's a relative term. Right, so um, they're not as open, you know, as uh, you know when we're dealing with uh, you know Western countries or other democracies, but they're more open than I thought they would be, and being on a university campus gives us the most, gives the Chinese scholars the most, the the largest degree of intellectual freedom that I think you find anywhere in China, more so than in the think tanks, especially in the government. So uh, we have very candid discussions, I have to say. But a lot of that is the environment that we worked hard to create, which is, you know, I basically said, this is not a forum for you to bring your talking points and pound your shoe on the table. This is a forum to really get things done, to better understand each other, uh, to understand the constraints that each side is working under, and most importantly, to find ways to begin solving problems that benefit China, benefit the international community. Well, uh, to make sure that we, we, we end before 9.30, I will have a couple of questions in a row. And I must ask the speakers to limit themselves to only one question and be, be brief. First, uh, a man in a blue shirt and then a man in suit over there. So be, be ready. You first, please. My name is Obi. I want to ask about the risk of a nuclear war breaking out by accident. Uh, Russia has been using nuclear 
nuclear war didn't break out in the early ages of uh, American uh, nuclear capacity. Uh, uh, what is the American assessment of the risk of a nuclear uh, attack by North Korea by accident? That's so, so the question is, what are the chances for a nuclear war to break out uh, on, the, on sheer accident? Uh, how to evaluate that risk? And then we have the gentleman over there. Remember to speak up and be brief. It's a different issue. It's more economics. Uh, uh, you said that China is very eager to break out because they have the nuclear weapons. But the question is, uh, what is the that requires that they also liberalize the power of the government to be reduced. Is the Communist Party prepared for that? And what could the influence be back to the evolution of the political system with a more liberalized and, and uh, uh, economy that we have here? So that was the question about if China is ready to liberalize its economy. First, uh, is there any chance for nuclear war breaking out by sheer accident? Uh, I think that um, it, with regard to the good question over here about uh, nuclear war, uh, potential for nuclear war by accident, I would start by saying the Chinese assessment of that for some reason is low. I'm not sure why, but you know, we talk to them about, about this a lot. And they're not that worried about the nuclear program. Now maybe they're becoming more worried, but to date they have not been. Um, the assessment in the United States obviously is higher. That, that this is a, a problem. But I think even higher than that is the proliferation risk. And, you know, in 2007, when I was working on this issue, uh, it was discovered that Syria had a nuclear, a plutonium production facility, uh, Israeli uh, imagery and pictures of it, and it looked almost exactly like the Yongbyon nuclear facility in North Korea, and there was um, uh, evidence that North Koreans had been there and had helped them build that program. That, can you, and now the Israelis took that uh, under their own, in their own hands and destroyed it. And so it's no longer in Syria. Uh, but can you imagine, given the situation in Syria today, if there was a plutonium production plant developing nuclear material for nuclear weapons, given the instability in Syria today. That, I think, is something that the American side is very concerned about, is the proliferation of nuclear material and technology and know-how from North Korea. Um, on the question of, if I understand your question, it's the economy has to liberalize, but to do that, the leadership will have to, is it, will have to give up, can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I don't think they want to give up power. Uh, but I think the thing that will force them to do so is the idea that if they cannot reform the economy to the satisfaction of the Chinese people, then the Communist Party, the existence of the Communist Party may be at risk. And so this may be a driving factor over time to get them to give up some of this control. If, but it's going to be very, I, I agree with the premise of your question, it'll be very, very difficult. And uh, the one thing that's very interesting, you know, can they do that? That's a major sort of shift. But if you look at the Chinese Communist Party of 1949, and then you look at the Communist Party of the early 80s, and you look at the Communist Party today, one thing that you will identify is they can course correct when they need to. And they have a history of it, right? They've adjusted to the times. It's not the Communist Party of 1949. And so perhaps, given that track record, perhaps they can make these changes. Uh, I think the jury is still out, but I wouldn't rule it out because they've done it when they've needed to over uh, the last uh, 60 years. We have sport, uh, four speakers left, so I take two co uh, questions in a row now. First, the gentleman here, and then we have the gentleman behind to prepare. So remember to be brief. Yeah. Good election, uh, Network for Human Rights in China. Mm. And uh, I think that's an important issue because it is about human dignity. 
so you probably are aware that there is a widespread and systematic torture of uh, prisoners of conscience in China. And you are probably also aware about the practice uh, of uh, force organ harvesting from such prisoners, mm -hmm. which has been uh, hearings in, in many parliaments and also in the US Senate. Okay. So my question is, what can you do? How can you help stop that? Mm -hmm. And can you raise such issues with your colleagues in mm -hmm. So the question is, what can Mr. Hanley do about the human rights situation in, in China? Uh, that's a good question. And then uh, the gentleman behind, please speak up. Yeah, my name is Rolf Hansen. I have a question on uh, given the um, increasing energy dependence of, uh, of China. Do you foresee them taking a more active role in the Middle East and how to deal with those issues? And just one concrete question, how would they deal with Syria? I mean, would they accept the regime change from above or would they stick with the existing regime? So the question is about energy independence for China and their role in the Middle East. This could be a, another long introduction, but I have to ask you to be brief, Mr. Hanley. Sure. Uh, thank you for your question on the human rights situation in China and the prisoners of conscience and the organ harvesting. Um, you know, the, the, your, your question, what you know, what can we do? I mean, I think you know, I'll just I'll just broaden it to say, what 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 can groups outside of China do? or inside of China do to uh, affect positive change. And, you know, this is a question that I struggled with in the U.S. government because, um, you know, obviously, you know, you, you keep it on the agenda, number one. Uh, you have to do that. Uh, you highlight it as an issue uh, of our values and something that we want to see changed. Um, but you get to the next point is what can you do to affect change? It's so difficult, right? The, the uh, you know, putting in, in place frameworks, you know, putting in place policies to affect that is for me one of the, was, was one of the most, I mean, I'd just be, you know, completely open, transparent. It was very difficult to do, you know. Uh, in, in the issue of dissidents, you know, we used to have a policy in the U.S. government of, you know, anytime we wanted a, the Chinese wanted some summit or they wanted something from us, you know, we would, hold out to release, you know, dissidents and, you know, they would release dissidents one or two or three at a time. But I don't think it ever really changed the overall policy of the Chinese government. And so, you know, you, you made life better for one or two or three people. And that's good. But, you know, what kind of overall impact did you have on the system? And um, while I think it's important that keep trying and keep it on the agenda and keep pressing. Um, I, I think it's a challenging question, and I think involved. If you're involved in that work, I commend you for it, because it's uh, it's incredibly frustrating and it's hard work to do. I think you know at the end of the day that they've got to change, want to change from from inside. I think the um, environment uh, is changing to the extent that Chinese people. You know, we have we can have these discussions at our center in the context of talking about, for example, China's public diplomacy, China's image around the world. You know, I'm glad to say, you know, do you realize that many people in the world look down on this situation and and what sh you know your uh, response? And I think that's the power of what we do at the at the center is, uh, as all of you know, when you leave your country and you go somewhere else and you have to and somebody criticizes your country, you have to defend your country and you begin to look at your country differently and you begin to, you know, be somewhat critical on your own country and, and want changes to be made because you've been put in a position to have to defend it. You don't want to defend it because it's not right. And so I think that's what the value of what we're doing with this international engagement is, you know, these questions are asked and they have to answer to them. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, they have to decide what, what kind of China they want. Uh, I hope I answer your question to some satisfaction. Uh, on the Middle East uh, rising uh, Chinese role, this is something that we've talked to the Chinese about uh, recently. Uh, and it's interesting the response we got from the Chinese. I mean, we say that, you know, the U.S. has Middle East fatigue, trying to, we're trying to pull ourselves out of the Middle East. Um, we're growing less dependent on Middle East oil. China's growing more dependent on Middle East oil. 
This means, of course, China, that you're going to have to play a larger role in the security and the stability of the Middle East. And the responses we got were, the U.S. will never be able to extract itself from the Middle East, whether it wants to or not. Uh, so we're not too worried about that. Uh, you've got Iran, you've got Syria, and you have your ally Israel. And for those reasons, it's not going to happen. Uh, secondly, China doesn't want to play a security role in, 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 and don't feel they can play a security role. Uh, and, and they don't want to do, send you know, military anywhere unless it's UN mandated. Um, but I do think they are thinking about this question much more today because they realize they're becoming vulnerable, they're becoming dependent on Middle East oil. Uh, and in one session we had, one Chinese scholar said, how about we split it up and you and the US do security and we'll do the economic piece. <laughs> and thought it was an interesting response. Uh, on Syria, it's interesting, you know, like in Libya, the Chinese now have been meeting with the opposition. They've presented now three proposals to deal with the Libyan situation. They have vetoed Security Council resolutions and have to some degree sort of hid behind Russia on this issue. But they have been shifting a little bit and I think that they, at this point, given that you know, they're meeting with the opposition and in their proposals they talk about that the opposition has to appoint somebody to be the legitimate leader of the opposition, I think this is leading to the point where they could over time accept some change of regime in, in Syria, in fact. I think they probably see that as, as a, an inevitable outcome to some degree. Okay, the last uh, two questions this morning comes from way behind. First, the lady in green, and then, then Tor. Remember to be brief, we are getting over time. Um, oh, sorry, just a quick question. Um, I'm a student of Chinese and uh, international relations, and um, while studying at Beta uh, this autumn, a lot of my Chinese friends told me that their plan was to, to move abroad as soon as possible because they wanted to escape China. So is this kind of brain drain a problem at all, or is the reservoir of brains in China too big for the Chinese government to even consider this? So the question is, uh, Chinese want to move abroad. Is this uh, a big problem? Tour, last one. Well, uh, uh, you touched upon my question, this uh, China's uh, interest in uh, securing its uh, commercial interest in natural resources. But uh, what would it take thinking of uh, or um, hijacking of uh, Chinese um, ships in the Aden Bukt, Aden Bay, would that push China into seeing that? Or um, interest in um, Afghanistan, I think I read about mineral resources being interest of China. Is there talks between shifting uh, the guard sort of? Thanks. So the question was, uh, I got the first part about the Auden book. I think we limited ourselves to answering this one. So the last questions for this morning, Mr. Anley. Sure. Uh, the question in the back on um, Chinese um, moving overseas, brain drain, I, I think I'll answer it this way. You know, I'm often asked if, uh, you know, China seems to be growing very confident, bordering on hubris. Uh, and I say that uh, there's also deep insecurity. It's a little bit of a schizophrenic mix of growing confidence and real deep insecurity. And I think that uh, you know, China's future, we don't know what China's future is going to be. It's uncertain. But for Chinese living there, especially the elite, they also don't know. I mean, they recognize that these challenges that China faces are significant. Uh, and they're uncertain about China's future. And so you're beginning to see, you know, this is reflected in uh, the kind of things that they're doing. Uh, many Chinese uh, are um, investing, you know, putting their money, or taking their winnings off the table, as we say, and, and investing in Europe or the United States, diversifying, pulling some of their money out of China because of this uncertainty. Secondly, they're sending their kids to you know, US universities. Xi Jinping's daughter is at Harvard University. Uh, and many senior leaders have their kids in universities overseas. And then I know that many government officials are in fact going to the United States to have their children so that they can get an American passport. So 
I think they're very patriotic, and they want to see China succeed, and they want to see China deal with these issues, and they would prefer, I think, to be able to stay in China and to see these changes made and to see China become a better place and to fulfill the China dream that Xi Jinping is talking about. But they're, but they're hedging their bets because of the uncertainty. And I think you know, that to some degree answers, hopefully answers your question. Um, on the China role in Afghanistan, I think this is, a, this is something we're talking about a lot now at the center. And uh, you know, on one hand, China did not like the United States and international security forces in Afghanistan, uh, too close to the Chinese border for them. But on the other hand, they realized that, that it was keeping Islamist extremists from going into the western part of China. So you know, they, they, they saw benefit as well. Uh, ultimately, they wanted us to leave. But now that we're leaving, they say, oh, don't, don't leave too quickly. Uh, <laughs> because you know, this could have negative effects on China. And so we're having a lot of discussions with them about you know, what should China's role be? How should it evolve? One is on the economic side, clearly, investment, infrastructure. But this is difficult because of the security situation. If the security situation uh, gets worse, it will be very difficult for the Chinese to go in and invest. When the Chinese go overseas and invest, they bring an army of Chinese laborers with them. And so if the security situation is bad, it will be very difficult for China to, to help. But they're not interested in uh, you know, bringing their own security troops there to help the situation. They are, they have contributed uh, 300 trainers, I guess, to train Afghan police. So they're doing things, probably not enough, but they're beginning to think through these. And I think as we get closer to the date where the international troops are gone, I think the Chinese will think about this even more.